This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Funded in part by... All it takes is a spark. One idea to take flight. The courage to seek the unknown. To innovate. Disrupt. To move us all forward. To explore a different perspective. At NASDAQ, we connect the world. Its ideas. Its capital. Its businesses. The people that drive global economies. The future isn't tomorrow. It's right now. All it takes is a spark. NASDAQ. Gradual increases in the federal funds rate will likely be appropriate in the months and years ahead. Ready or not, an interest rate increase might be coming soon, and it could mark a turning point for your money and your investments. Risky business, our homeowners opening their favorite piggy bank again, their homes. A better deal? The Commerce Secretary plans to be aggressive to fix bad trade deals, but some business owners along the U.S.-Mexico border are concerned. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Friday, March the 3rd. Good evening again, everybody, and welcome. I'm Bill Griffith, and tonight, Tyler Matheson. And I'm Sue Herrera. Well, we start with Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen may have sent the clearest signal yet that an interest rate increase is near. Her speech today capped a week of talk from central bank officials, many who said that tighter monetary policy seems to make sense, barring, of course, any big economic surprises. The Fed last raised interest rates in December, only its second interest rate hike in a decade. Rising rates impact everybody, from home buyers to savers, and they, they ripple through the global economy, which is why investors are paying close attention. Steve Leisman takes a look at where Ms. Yellen stands just days before the Fed's next meeting. Fed Chair Janet Yellen putting an exclamation point on the market's expectations for a rate hike in March, saying in a speech in Chicago, it was on the way if the economy is on course when the Fed meets in 10 days. At our meeting later this month, the committee will evaluate whether employment and inflation are continuing to evolve in line with our expectations, in which case a further adjustment of the federal funds rate would likely be appropriate. Yellen also affirmed her belief that the Fed would hike three times this year and gave the economy a pretty good bill of health. The Fed chair said the U.S. had shown remarkable resilience amid a series of shocks, and now it was close to hitting the Fed's employment and inflation goals. Yellen even suggested the U.S. is getting some help from abroad, which has been a main source of weakness for the U.S. economy. At this point, I'm pleased to be able to say that looking at the global economy, at least over the next few years, I see the risks as more balanced than I have it's in some time. Yellen stuck to her gun, saying there's too much uncertainty right now to forecast the effects of new policies coming from the Trump administration. But it does seem that the prospect of these policies is giving the Fed confidence that it can exit this long period of low rates with minimal fallout. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman in New York. Well, confidence that the Fed could raise interest rates later this month is just one reason behind the big run-up in bank stocks this week with some names reaching levels not seen since the financial crisis. But is there more room to run in this sector? John Petrides is portfolio manager at Point View Wealth Management. He's here to talk about that tonight. Sounds like all they have to do now is just conduct the vote. I mean, it right. sounds like a fait accompli, right? Yeah, that, that's true. But I think it's uh, short-sighted just to look at one vote. We have to look at where's the trend going and where's the pace. Clearly, the economy's running at a stronger level. Uh, the jobs data has been really strong. Uh, the, the big uh, message here, though, is that the Fed is able to con convey their message of raising rates without seeing any volatility in the stock market, right. Right. which has not happened in the past. So you have VIX at the volatility index at all-time low levels. You, you say, though, that the market is not fully appreciating the fact that the Fed may be more aggressive this right. year than, than they are the underlying assumption. Right. So if the Fed raises rates three times this year, we're at 50 basis points, half of 1 percent. So if we raise three times, that gets us to 1.25 percent on the uh, Fed funds rate by the end of the year. Right. So that means if in June we keep adding 200,000 jobs per month, 
by June, investors are going to say, OK, we know where the Fed is. Where are we going to be in 2018? Mm -hmm. And if you have the Trump and the Republican administration pouring kerosene on the economy by having some sort of tax reform, infrastructure spending and deregulation that could propel the stock market higher, we could be talking about the Fed funds rate at 275, maybe 3 percent by the end of 18. And with rates going up at that rate, banks can get back to the old fashioned business of borrowing and lending and right. making money on the spread between those two. Is it that simple? Do you just buy all the banks as a result or are they all created equal here? Right. No, I, I like the larger banks, Citigroup and Bank of America in particular, because uh, although the bank sector has run up 24 percent post the election, uh, the valuation is still actually quite compelling. As Warren Buffett always says, a, a, a stock, the price of a stock is where it is. The value is what you actually get, right? The, pay, the price is what you pay. Value is what you buy. Citigroup in particular is still trading at a discount to its uh, book value. Uh, I'm not suggesting that Citigroup goes back to where we were before the crisis, but where the bank, uh, health of the bank's balance sheet is today and with interest rates rising, it should be trading at a discount. How much of... of your affinity for the bank stocks is also based on the fact that we may get a rollback in regulation. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are three pillars to what's going to drive bank stocks higher. One is obviously the interest rates, uh, two, earnings quality, and three, then deregulation. And it, it, we're uncertain as to what the form of deregulation is going to be. Let's say right now a bank has to hold 12 percent of reserves on its balance sheet. And let's say they lower that to the requirement being 10 percent. Well, now the deregulation just freed up 2 percent of reserves for banks that they can uh, reinvest in their business, bring back their shareholders, go back to paying out a dividend, and you go back to the glory days of the banking industry. We will see. John right. Petridis of Point View Wealth Management. Good to see you. Thanks, Thanks. for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Well, stocks inched higher, taking the notion of a possible interest rate hike pretty much in stride. Historically, the mention of an increase would cause stocks to fall, but that didn't happen today. And market watchers say it may be because the central bank has been prepping investors for some time. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose two points to finish at 21,005. The Nasdaq was up nine and the S&P 500 added one. For the week, all of the major indexes were higher. Economically speaking, the services sector saw its strongest monthly growth in nearly a year, according to the Institute of Supply Management. Activity in the largest part of the overall economy was stronger than expected in February. The recent increase in both the services and the manufacturing sectors could signal that business investment will start to pick up after a recent downturn. Reworking some trade deals has become a big issue for the economy and for American workers. Today, the Commerce Secretary promised to take a proactive role to make sure the U.S. is getting good deals globally. In his first interview since being confirmed, Wilbur Ross told CNBC that his primary focus will be promoting exports. We'll be aggressive on trade because we know that the deals that have been made historically have resulted in the great loss of manufacturing jobs, great amount of closures of manufacturing businesses. We don't want that to continue. So first emphasis will be on facilitating U.S. exports to other countries, getting rid of both tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade. And topping Mr. Ross's priority list is the renegotiation of the North American Free Trade Agreement with Mexico and Canada, NAFTA. He wants the terms of the deal to be more favorable to the U.S. But on the U.S.-Mexico border, some business owners are concerned about too much change. Contessa Brewer, tonight in Nogales, Arizona. Noe Garcia stands atop a hill in Nogales, a sweeping vista of rugged terrain, and imagines what could be. He bought 215 acres, the last parcels of land here, to be zoned for light industrial development. So here, what we envision is to build 30, 100,000 square warehouses. So the numbers are in the thousands of jobs. He's already graded down a 40-acre lot, doing much of the work himself to save money. A dual citizen with family on both sides of the border, he says President Trump's talk of border taxes, doing away with NAFTA, a massive wall and immigration crackdown is scaring Mexican investors. We had a couple of um, vegetable growers and fruit growers that they wanted to establish here. Um, there's Mexican investors that own warehouses here for distribution. Um, they have backed out 
and they're waiting to see what happens. Within view of Garcia's would-be industrial park stands Cerulli Brothers Warehouse, a third-generation family business of produce distributors. It's incredibly important to us that this border stays open and flowing with product from Mexico to the U.S. More than half of all imported produce comes from Mexico, and Nogales is the largest port of entry for those fresh fruits and vegetables. The last few years have seen record growth in volume and value. Business is booming, but the prospect of a border tax is looming. Increasing the cost of fresh fruits and vegetables and making people buy processed food, that doesn't help the American economy, nor does it help the actual American people. U.S. Customs says $17 billion a year passes through the Nogales Crossing. Raw materials, finished products, employees, even financing moves both ways. Luis Fernando Para is an attorney specializing in cross-border commerce. His clients are looking with a wary eye to Washington. These companies are, are having second thoughts about um, building these warehouses and having second thoughts as to uh, employing uh, folks here in the U.S. so that these warehouses can run efficiently. When it comes to free trade, those who rely on it don't think NAFTA should just be scrapped. But they say after more than two decades, perhaps it could use a tune-up with more attention paid to employment, the environment, intellectual property, and digital technology. When that happens, you lose trust. And uh, uncertainty in trust is an enemy of trade and, and trust. Do you have any concern in your mind that your property might be in jeopardy because of what's happening in Washington? This is my dream. I came here. Um, I came to Nogales. I think it's a great place to live. I went to school and I said, I'm going to establish my business here. This is America. I'm dreaming my American dream and they're killing it. For Nightly Business Report, Contessa Brewer, Nogales, Arizona. Canada's Prime Minister today defended the North American Free Trade Agreement, but said he looks forward to working with President Trump to make improvements to that deal. The benefits of NAFTA over the uh, past uh, decades in terms of uh, increased jobs uh, for both Canadians and Americans uh, uh, have been clear. There's always opportunities to improve uh, trade deals. NAFTA has been uh, improved uh, a dozen times over the past 20 years. And uh, we look forward to sitting down uh, with, uh, with President Trump to talk about uh, how we can make sure that we are uh, helping the middle class in both of our countries. The Prime Minister also reiterated the importance of the close trading relationship between the U.S. and Canada. Still ahead, healthy prognosis? Why our market monitor says now is the time to invest in health care stocks. Shares of airlines got a lift after the White House said it is suspending an Obama administration decision to examine industry pricing. The transparency review was basically a probe into a longtime practice by some airlines of preventing travel websites from showing their fares. United, Continental, American and Alaska Air were some of today's biggest gainers in the aviation sector. This is a great story. Snapchat's founders are not the only ones who made a lot of money on the company's IPO this week. So did a Silicon Valley high school. It's a private Catholic high school that invested $15,000 in seed money in Snap back in 2012 based on a recommendation from a venture capitalist who happened to be a parent of a student at that school. Well, the school sold most but not all of their shares when the company came public yesterday and they earned a cool $24 million. Meanwhile, they're still making money. Snap shares were up again today by more than 10 percent. NBC Universal invested half a billion dollars in Snap's IPO. The move is part of NBC's bigger push into digital media as growth increasingly comes from online content. In the past 18 months, NBC has also made investments in Vox and BuzzFeed. NBC Universal is the parent company of CNBC, which produces this program. Homeowners are getting wealthier, of course, thanks to fast-rising real estate prices around the country. And now they're tapping into that wealth in greater numbers again. 
So are we back to the risky days of the housing boom? Diana Olick has some answers for us tonight. Ever since the epic housing crash, homeowners have been very conservative with their home equity, but that's starting to change. Now that home prices are rising faster than expected, homeowners are tapping that newfound equity at a faster clip, and they're also risking more up front. Two signs are worth watching. First, home equity lines of credit, usually second loans that allow you to pull cash out of your house when you need it. They dropped dramatically after the crash, but are now up 21% in the past two years to the highest level since 2008, that according to Moody's Analytics. We're also seeing more loan refinances, where borrowers increase the loan size and take cash out. Also, home buyers are putting less down today on their purchases. Before the last housing boom, the median down payment was over 7%, then it dropped to 3% and then shot back up to 7 during the recovery as lending tightened up. Now down payments are shrinking again to a 6% average, all according to Adam Data Solutions. This as more lenders offer low down payment products. Add it up and homeowners are leaning toward more leverage again. One caveat though, home equity is still rising due to rising prices. But if prices are overheated, as some suggest, and are ripe for a correction, then homeowners could see a pinch again. I'm not saying prices will go down nationally, but the increases could shrink and some markets could go negative. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. WPP Group forecasts a tough year ahead, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. The world's largest advertising firm reported net sales growth for 2016 that was in line with estimates, but the company said a sluggish start to 2017 in a very competitive ad market prompted WPP to slash its sales outlook for the full year. Shares fell almost 8 percent to 107.91. Big Lots said a difficult retail environment and a lower store count caused the company to post disappointing revenue and same-store sales. Profit did come in ahead of expectations, and the discount retailer said it would raise its quarterly dividend by 19 percent to 25 cents a share. Shares rose nearly 4 percent to 54.23. Revlon, which sells many of its makeup products in drugstores, said consumers shifting to specialty cosmetic chains caused sales to fall flat last year. The company also reported a loss, citing currency headwinds and restructuring charges. Revlon shares were off 4 percent to 32.65. Canadian-based retailer Hudson Bay, which owns Lord & Taylor and Saks Fifth Avenue here in the U.S., may not have the funds to finalize a takeover for Macy's. Hudson has reportedly failed to secure equity financing for that deal, which in turn has caused talks between the two companies to be put on hold for now. Macy's shares down 4% as a result to $31.77 today. Drug makers AstraZeneca and Sanofi said that they would be working together now to develop a medication for preventing a respiratory condition in newborns called RSV. That is the most common cause for respiratory tract infections in infants worldwide. AstraZeneca shares rose nearly 1 percent to 29.92, while shares of Sanofi were up more than 1.5 percent to $44.24. And Verizon is buying back up to 100 million of its own shares. The telecom giant also declared a quarterly dividend of more than 57 cents a share. The annualized yield now is at 4.6 percent. Shares up 11 cents today to $50.09. And now to our market monitor, who is finding opportunity in the healthcare sector. This is not her first time on the program, but it is as a market monitor. Joining us is Nancy Tangler, Chief Investment Officer at Heartland Financial. Good to see you again, Nancy. Welcome back. Thank you, Sue. Good to see you. Let's start with your first pick. It is Amgen. Uh, the stock is up 20 percent year to date. It still has room to run in your mind? It does indeed. Uh, the whole healthcare group began to underperform, particularly biotech, when Hillary Clinton tweeted last spring about uh, drug prices. We began to buy pretty aggressively. And uh, though the stock is up, it yields about 2.6 percent. The dividend growth over the last five years has been about 35 percent per year. And, and it's trading at a below market price to earnings ratio. So that means it's cheaper than the market, but it's growing faster than the market. So we like this stock a lot and we like the group in general because the dividend growth is about two thirds of total return for stock investors over time. So it's very important to collect that that mm -hmm. dividend. Yeah, speaking, like of, speaking of which, there's Johnson & Johnson, an old chestnut from the entire sector. It hasn't performed stock-wise as well as some others. 
but it does have that rather juicy dividend, doesn't it? It does, Bill. It's good to see you again. Nice to see uh, Nancy. So so up about, you know, yield about 2.6 percent, grows the dividend about 7 percent, you know, a year over the last five years. But this stock's up 10.5 percent over the last 20 years annually. So that's compared to an S&P that's up 7.7. So because of its diversification, it never really goes to the races, but it does generate just stable, steady returns. And they've really put an emphasis on the pharmaceutical side of the business, and that grew 12 percent last quarter. So we think this is a great way, um, you know, despite risks of the talcum powder um, lawsuits, this is a company who has a history of doing the right thing, starting with the Tylenol a uh, cyanide problem back in 1982 that killed seven people. Right. Company, yeah. Uh, Abbott Labs is the last ABT. Uh, you say it's a way to play the group defensively. It is. So Miles Davis is a great CEO. He just made a big acquisition of St. Jude. This is a company that also has a lower dividend yield, about 2.3 percent, but they've been growing at about 18 percent per year over the last three years. And what you're going to get from them is stable growth and, again, at a below market valuation. So we like that. If we can get faster than market earnings growth at a cheaper price, that's a win-win for our mm -hmm. clients. Quickly, Nancy, the president has talked a lot lately about capping drug price increases. That's been the buzz for Washington for quite some time. What does that do to these companies? Well, I don't think it's true, actually. He's really been talking uh, privately with the CEOs about bring jobs back and I'll back off on pricing. He's also, um, you know, said that he wants to fast track drug, drug approvals. That's really the big piece of news because th this was the same thing we saw in the Clinton administration. Uh, and those stocks outperformed the S&P during that period by over 100 full percentage points. Wow. So uh, this is the solution to lower health care problems, you know, advancement and R&D in pharmaceuticals. These companies will benefit. All right. On that note, Nancy, thanks so much for joining us again. Have a great weekend. You too, Sue. Thank you, Bill. Nancy Tangler with Heartland Financial. Coming up, financial touchdown. What one football team is doing to prepare players for life after the game. a look at what to watch for next week. On Monday, global markets will have their first chance to react to China's new economic growth targets expected to be released this weekend. On Thursday, the European Central Bank meets to discuss interest rates and the region's economy. And on Friday, we'll get the biggest economic release of the week, the monthly employment report. And that is what to watch for next week. Mercedes-Benz is recalling more than 350,000 of its vehicles. The issue is a part for the starter that could overheat and cause a fire. The recall involves certain C-Class, E-Class, CLA, GLA, and GLC cars and SUVs that were manufactured between 2015 and 2017. College football athletes are being put to the test in showcasing their talents during the NFL Combine. But long term, it's not just about winning on the field. As Morgan Brennan reports, it's also about being successful off the field. Life after football. The Miami Dolphins are getting schooled and winning off the field. Boom, they hit into one another. This week, 16 players travel to New York for a business combine. Dolphins owner and real estate billionaire Stephen Ross arranged for his NFL team. I think as an owner, I have a responsibility to make sure they develop as great football players to prolong their career. But also, the fact is, I think it's a responsibility to make sure they're developed when their career is when they're, when it's over. And I think that's how I saw it. And it's great for the team. It brings them closer together. It's great for our organization and we're trying to be the best in class. This tour of Hudson Yards in Midtown Manhattan is one of more than a dozen events players will partake in over the course of a week. Well, they probably want to be playing football as long as they can, but when they're done, they want to think about their future. And for them to come in here um, and speak with our executives um, and learn what, you know, what we're doing. You know, one of them was just asking me you know, about you know, what's the difference between a steel building and a concrete building and why we would build steel versus concrete. 
From Manhattan's $25 billion Hudson Yards project, which Ross's related companies is developing, to a lunchtime Q&A with the CEO of Equinox. The football pros have been meeting entrepreneurs at more than a dozen scheduled events to learn more about business and investing. To kind of shadow, you know, these business, you know, millionaires, billionaires, it's, it's an amazing opportunity. Football is a short career, so um, that being said, you have to always plan for, for the next step. Players chose to participate, paying thousands of dollars out of pocket for the trip. The goal? Make connections that will last long beyond their playing years. I do think it's a great way of giving back, but I also think that as a brand, you know, fitness at its core, that we speak a common language, and I think a lot of these athletes are, will be great employees for Equinox. With so many pro athletes going broke after their NFL careers, Ross is determined to make sure his players don't become just another statistic. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan. And for more on how the Miami Dolphins are preparing for life after football, head to our website, nbr.com. And that will do it for us on Nightly Business Report. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you Monday. Nightly Business Report has been funded in part by... All it takes is a spark. One idea to take flight. The courage to seek the unknown. To innovate. Disrupt. To move us all forward to explore a different perspective. At NASDAQ, we connect the world, its ideas, its capital, its businesses, the people that drive global economies. The future isn't tomorrow, it's right now. All it takes is a spark. NASDAQ.